Oh, the sound of the saints fellowshipping. What a joy. It's hard to break you up, but uh, I would like to take you on a very exciting journey tonight. In fact, I remember the very first time that I had to sit through a, a seminary level biblical archaeology class, and it was a sleeper, I'll tell you. Uh, and, and I learned some good lessons there about, about how not to bore everybody to death. So. Uh, for one thing, it, it was all text, and there, we never saw what we were talking about, so tonight we're going to see what we talk about. But biblical archaeology is just one of the elements that are a part, working together, of helping us to interpret the Bible. Now, what I mean by that, there are two views of biblical archaeology uh, that are in Christendom. Uh, in fact, I, I won't be so bold tonight as to name the name of the Christian schools, but the Christian schools colleges, universities, seminaries across the country in America line up under one of two views of biblical archaeology. The first one is called the maximalist. And I would be a maximalist, which means this, that, that we believe that the Bible is flawlessly inspired history. Now, it's not it's, it's not an exhaustive history. It really only mentions China once. The word China is in the Bible. It's in Isaiah. But it isn't talking about all the dynasties, you know, the Ming and the Tang and the Qing and all these things. But anything it says about history is an eyewitness account from the only person you can trust your soul with. It's absolutely reliable. So a maximalist is someone that believes that the Bible interprets the debris. The minimalists are obviously the opposite. And there are vast number of Christian schools in America that believe that if the Bible says one thing and if an unsaved archaeologist who has a predisposition in, in every way to, to think there's no way the Bible could be true, and if he disagrees and that then the Bible is wrong, and that's the minimalist view. So I would be a maximalist uh, view. But let me show you how that involves uh, biblical interpretation. Uh, first of all, the Bible's history is inspired. And so the key to piecing together the archaeological findings, uh, do you remember that, that, um, that archaeology digs down through layers of dirt? And so they piece together. Did you know they get all these little pieces and they have to fit them together? And there is something that, that guides them in that. And for the maximalist, it would be if the Bible says that an event in the Bible took place there, they're looking for, for evidence of that. They're looking for that to show up. If you don't think that the Bible is probably absolutely authoritative, then you would, for example... Uh, Recently, an archaeologist has been digging in the city of David, and I'll show you a picture of it in, in a few moments. That archaeologist is a Jew, an unbelieving Jew, doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, but they were scorned by the entire archaeological community because this archaeologist, it's a woman, as she excavated in the city of David, she said, I read in the book of 1 Samuel that King David built a palace just south of where his son Solomon built the temple. So she said there is going to be a monumental palatial structure here because it says it in 1 Samuel. Now she's not a Christian, doesn't believe anything like we do. The archaeological community just scoffed and mocked and carried on and guess what she found 10 years ago? She found a palatial structure that exactly matches what, what the scriptures described. And it was right where the Bible said it would be. So only the Bible has the unchanging account of history, past, present, and future. All other histories, and, and I collect books, and I have many books of, of historical content, they're constantly revising them, constantly bringing the new findings. The Bible doesn't need any new findings because God just wrote it down correctly the first time. Okay, everything happens somewhere. 
That's geography. Have you ever thought about that? Everything happened somewhere. You localize where it happened, and you have, have begun, I'm talking about human events on Earth, you have geo earth graphy, writing about what the location of things on Earth. So everything happened somewhere and sometime. Everything happening sometime is history. It happened at a point, and it happened at a place. So Bible geography is the place these things happen, and Bible history is the, the when it happened, that, that event that's talked about. Now, when you combine those two ideas into the land of the book, that's the lands where the Bible occurred, you get biblical archaeology. See, biblical archaeology is just combining the geography of the Bible with the history of the Bible. And you find remains of where things happened and when. And you know what's amazing? They all match up with the Bible, and that affects our interpretation because what we see in the archaeology gives a, a visual to what our minds, as we read these words, you know, you kind of have, as you're reading, you have a picture in your mind, but then when either that picture is, is enhanced or it's, it's refined, it's just amazing. Uh, to God, the single most important geographic location on, Earth's, uh, on Earth is where Christ was dedicated by his parents, where he taught many of his key teachings, like John 10, a couple weeks ago. I told you exactly where Jesus, because the Bible tells you exactly where Jesus taught John 10. Some of his good shepherd teachings, we know just where, not only historically that took place, but geographically where that took place. So biblical archaeology is involved. Uh, where he was tried, where he was condemned, where he was crucified, where he was buried, where he rose, where he ascended, where his church was born. We know right where, where the church was born on a Sunday morning. We know exactly the day of the week the church was born on. It's the same day that Jesus rose from the dead, only 50 days later. It's exactly, exactly beautifully laid out in the scriptures. And where he will return at his second coming. And that, that place where those seven key events are recorded in the Bible is the city of Jerusalem. To God, Jerusalem is the center of redemptive history. And geographically, like the medieval maps, they used to put Jerusalem at the center of the world. Did you know that, that people talk about how archaic that is when they look at those maps? But did you know that shows a, a theocentricity? God centers his attention on Jerusalem. In fact, the Psalms say that his throne is over, that, that he is over Jerusalem. In fact, and I've told you this many times, we'll do it when we go into biblical geography, but even the Hebrew words for directions are fascinating. The Hebrew word for in front of is the word that you see translated in the Bible as east. It's the Hebrew word speaks as if God is sitting on a throne in the temple or tabernacle looking out the door and and in front of is the word east behind his back is the word west to his right hand is the word south and to his left hand is the word north because God even gives directions based on Jerusalem and and it's just a fascinating uh, understanding of the Hebrew language okay so to understand biblical archaeology and all of the land of the book, and especially Jerusalem, are very important. To explain simple biblical archaeology, we would take the scriptures. We would apply the historic framework God's Word presents. We'd sort out all the various archaeological remains into their biblical context. Because only the Bible is an eyewitness account by someone that has no human bias. You understand that? See, all of us see things from our angle. And, and that's why, you know, if there's an accident, the police go around and they find a couple friends of yours that showed up to try and help your insurance. And then they, they, they talk to a few other people because they're trying to not get a biased account. The only unbiased account are the scriptures. To use Jerusalem as an example, the surface of the ground would be the present, and then the deeper you go, the more levels of past biblical history you'd pass through. If we were to show Jerusalem's layers by recognized secular. Now, I'm just going to use, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain 
the biblical events in the secular framework. For example, just this past July, I stood with a whole group from Calvary and, and from many other churches, and we stood at the uh, Sancta Scala. That's the, the steps Martin Luther climbed up on his knees, remember, when he came to faith in Christ. It's in Rome. And that building is still there. And as we stood there, I said, would you all just look across the road? Do you see anything funny over there? And they all looked across the road, and they said, yeah, it looks like the Washington Monument. I said, yeah, what is that doing here? They said, I don't know. We came on the tour. You tell us. I said, that's the largest Egyptian obelisk ever taken out of Egypt. It weighs 483 tons, solid granite, and it's sitting over there. Why is it there? Well, it's there because Pope Sixtus, the whoever, was showing off his power, and he put it there. But did you know the hieroglyphics are still on that thing? And Egyptologists have looked over there, and do you know who made that? Largest obelisk in, in the whole city of Rome, the largest one ever to escape from Egypt? The Pharaoh, whose oldest son died, and his second-born son became the Pharaoh. And in Wikipedia, if you can trust anything out of Wikipedia, <laughs> it says that that Pharaoh that made that obelisk across the road, it's the Lateran, if you ever heard of St. John in Laterano, the church, that's the mother church of Rome. St. Peter's is not. The Basilica of Rome is not the Vatican. It is St. John in Laterano. That's been the original place of the Roman Catholic Church since the 4th century, and it still is where the ex-cathedra seat is. But that obelisk has nothing to do with the church or with Rome. It was built by the one who lost his firstborn son. Now, Wikipedia tells you, and Britannica and anybody else, that that, that obelisk was, was built by a pharaoh that was alive in 1446 B.C. The Bible tells you that's when the, the plague of the, the, the final tenth plague swept through Egypt on a Friday night because they went out. You know, it was on a Sabbath eve. And, and that's where Friday the 13th comes from, if you ever want to know. I mean, the whole idea, that was a very unlucky Friday for anybody that had a firstborn son. But, but secular, you can take the secular dates, like the Wikipedia date, and you look at that date, and you look at that obelisk, and you say, as we stood there, we said, the man that built that 483-ton thing was the one who looked God in the face and mocked him and wouldn't let his people go. So let me just get to this. Uh, this would be, let's put a house here. This is the surface of the earth. This is a uh, Samaritan's Purse house, okay, right here. We just saw them build it. You know, here it is sitting on the ground. The one you saw was on a slab. If you were in Jerusalem, that dirt would be part of the 1948 onward prophecy fulfilled state of Israel. But did you know that under it would be layer after layer after layer after layer of continuous habitation? Uh, Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed 30 plus times. Now, this is secular dating. Now, they're real small, and I'll just tell you. The British were there from 1917 to 47. The Ottomans were there from the time of Martin Luther through World War I. The Ottomans, that's a, another word for the Ottoman Empire, which is Turkey. And Turkey was the big player in the Middle East, and they're coming back, by the way. Um, they're, they're hoping to revive their empire. The Mamluks were Egyptian uh, Muslims, and they swept through Jerusalem, and they controlled it from after the Crusades through the time of Martin Luther. The Crusaders, uh, the misguided um, Christians in name only, uh, murderers, I mean, the Crusaders really weren't a good, if you've ever read all the Crusades, it was a real strange period of time. But what the Crusades did is, the Crusades conquered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and other parts of Jerusalem back in 1099, but what really happened, most of us should be very thankful for the Crusades, they went back to medieval, dark Europe. 
with spices, with medicines, with literature, with manuscripts, with scientific insights that the Europeans had lost in the Dark Ages. The Romans had known all this stuff, but the Dark Ages and the decline of Europe and the, the just rot that Europe had gotten into, the, it had just gotten very, very dark. And they came back from the Holy Land with all this stuff which spurred, if you know anything about history, the Renaissance which went into the Reformation. The Arab Muslims are the level below that. The Persians came in 638 and they stayed until they were driven out by the Crusaders. The Byzantines, uh, most people don't even realize Byzantine is Rome in the east. Uh, the Roman Empire was, was uh, you know, a western empire. If you're looking at a map, the western side was Rome. The eastern side was Constantinople. This side uh, remained, the Byzantine side stayed. There was a Roman emperor sitting on a throne in Constantinople when Christopher Columbus was alive. That's how long the Roman Empire lasted. The Roman Empire declined or ended in 1453 AD and it started in 776 BC. 2200 years Rome existed. Uh, it's just uh, an amazing uh, long period of time. But the Eastern Empire is this Byzantine Empire. This is a very important thing to us. This is not only the monastic period, this is when all the church councils. Did you grow up in a church that quotes the Chalcedonian Creed or quotes, you know, any of the, the great creeds of the church? Those are from councils. And those councils were all sponsored during the Byzantine period, and much of the events circulated around the Holy Land. And so if you dug down through the dirt, under your house in Jerusalem, you would be going through these layers. You'd hit the Byzantine layer, and then there's the, the Roman period, uh, time of persecution and when the church really grew. Then you would get down to the time of the, the fall of, of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, that's when the, the post-apostolic fathers, the people that, that are so critical to understanding the early church. Then Rome, this, this is when the, the occupation during Christ time. That's a whole period of time you dig through, but it keeps going. That's the problem with digging anything in Jerusalem. Under it is something more, something older, something amazing. The Hasmoneans or the Maccabees, the Hellenists, that's the Alexander the Great, the Persians, as in Iran, which the whole Persian period, uh, that's the time when Darius, the Mede, and all that. That's the time of Daniel, Ezra, and Alexander the Great. Before that is what's called in sec By the way, these are all secular. These are not in the Bible. These are secular titles. But the Iron Age is from the time of the judges through the time of Daniel. So Samuel, Saul, David, and to Daniel is what is called the Iron Age in archaeological terms. The Bronze Age has three parts, late, middle, and early. Uh, this one is when this obelisk I told you about is from. That's from the, the time of, of uh, well, it's just after. Actually, the obelisk would be from right here. But this is the time of the bondage. Moses, the Exodus, and the judges are all in this period of time. The patriarchs to the bondage in Egypt, and then finally Abraham visiting Jerusalem. So all of that. But look at this. We know, do you see this black line? That's when God flooded the whole earth. So nothing, they're, they're, did you know the pyramids have to be on this side of the flood? They couldn't have survived a global flood. They're hardly surviving the sandstorms. You know, they're falling apart as it is. They were not in a global flood that totally changed the whole topography of the surface of the planet. See, maximalists believe this line. They believe that God erased and buried and squashed and crushed all other civilizations. And there's nothing standing on this world that, that they are finding in any archaeological digs of, of the surface layers that is from before the flood. There is no pre-flood civilizations that, that are findable. And so uh, there are bones and dinosaur bones and everything else from the flood time. But this period of time is uh, buried under sometimes uh, a mile 
of flood debris. Remember, the Grand Canyon was laid down and then formed with the Great Basin of water that was in North America. I mean, all the volcanism, but I'm not doing the flood tonight. So, But if you were in Jerusalem, this is a dig. See, archaeologists, what they do is they start digging away the dirt, trying to get down to see all of the ages, and that's what they've done in Jerusalem. So let's see, what, what have they found? Uh, whoop, back up. A biblical archaeology helps us see the past. God's Word tells us about almost 3,000 different people. God's Word describes several hundred places by name, geographic points, uh, countless events, and then it links the people, the places, and the events together. And all are seen more clearly in the implications of what happened when you look at them through the Bible. So that's what I'd like to do with you tonight. So just for a second, take your Bible. And let me real quickly, before we go tonight, I'm going to show you uh, a few examples. Look at Genesis 11. We'll start in Genesis. And I'm going to show you how you can uh, interpret the Bible because of truths that uh, correspond with archaeology. Chapter 11 of Genesis, and it says... Um, Verse 31, at the end of the, the uh, 11th chapter, and Terah took his son Abram and his, his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, and they went out from the Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. Okay, here's Ur of the Chaldees, and here's the land of Canaan. And there's two ways it could have gone, because this is a vast desert. Uh, Todd Aaron would never have crossed it because memory city can only be seven miles from a Starbucks and there are no Starbucks between there at all. There is one trade route that's very treacherous that's known if you know where the oases are, you can make it from place to place. But the majority of people followed what is called the Fertile Crescent. They went up like this following the, the more watered, more civilized areas. So most likely... What Abraham did is he followed, and I, I want to erase all this so you see what was here before I started drawing. These lines, you see these red lines, are the trade caravan routes. Everything in the Bible so follows these caravan routes. Um, this one most likely is the one that Abraham would have come down on. He temporarily stayed up here in Haran and then so he would have gone up like this come back down and he came into the land coming down in fact Shechem right there is one of the places it's mentioned in the Bible so so look what it says they they died in uh, Terah died up here in Haran so they came from Ur they followed the trade route went up there now verse 1 the Lord told Abraham to go and so Abraham does take off, and he goes to verse 6 of chapter 12. He goes right here, Shechem. He followed that trade route down and went right down there to Shechem. Now you say, what does that have to do with uh, interpreting the Bible? Well, let me show you a few things. It's so interesting what else are on these trade routes. The trade route here in Damascus, this is the city of Damascus that's having all the fighting right now, the trade route splits off and goes by the water. This is called, if you've ever heard, Via Maris. Mare is the sea. That is the Via Maris. It's one of the most important roads of the ancient world. This one is called the King's Highway. And it went down, uh, and they could take shipping and all this. So this one is the King's Highway, and this is the Via Maris. You know what's so interesting? When this comes down right here, this Via Maris, when it goes from Damascus, right there where that circle is, it has to go into a narrow pass that skirts along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there was always a tax booth right there in the middle of that circle where the Via Maris came across there. And it was at a city called Capernaum. And Matthew sat there at that tax booth. Why did Jesus make Capernaum his town in the New Testament? Because anything that anybody heard in Capernaum would go to the ends of the earth. 
it would go down all these trade routes because this was a crossroads where those trade routes, it, actually there's one that swung under the lake too. And so the, the ancient trade routes are where the gospel message and where the, the biblical characters followed those routes. Okay, let me, sh let me show you, Oop, back up, just real quickly. Um, and we're going to get this more in biblical geography. But during the period from the Judges, 1200 B.C., through Samuel, about uh, 1050 B.C., this is what Israel looked like, the tribal areas. You notice this is the Jordan River right there. Do you notice how much of Israel is in modern-day Jordan? How much of the promised land is... Did you know when people say West Bank, this is called the West Bank. Do you know what Christians should say? The West Bank of the Euphrates? Because, see, God gave them all the way up into what would be the region that would be on the Euphrates. He didn't give them just this little strip from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. They had over here, and David extended it out that way. Uh, real quickly, let's do Saul to David. Uh, United Kingdom, it was the same. Uh, David extended it in his conquest much beyond that. By the time of Jeroboam, 830 B.C. is Jeroboam II, when Israel, uh, under its divided state, uh, this is the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. This is Judah, the good guys, that didn't become calf worshipers. And this is Israel, the northern kingdom, and the dividing line. And Jerusalem is right there uh, on the, the northern part of Judah. But this is what it looked like uh, during all that you read about in First and Second Kings and um, that whole period of, of uh, decline. Um, now, this is fascinating. Uh, and, and I won't, you can't see this slide very well, but if you could see it, there's something here that looks like a tombstone. And if you can see, there's another one right there that looks like a tombstone. And you can't see it but very well, but there are steps going up. This is a gate to a city, Geshur. This is where Absalom's mother was from. It's also, in the New Testament, this city is called Bethsaida. That should ring bells. That's where Peter and Andrew were from. So Peter and Andrew were from the same city that Absalom's mother was from. But you say, who cares? Well, this is fascinating. This corrects so many of our misconceptions. <laughs> Excuse me, these things that look like tombstones, that thing right there, those are high places. Did you know when you read the Bible, it's always talking about, and the high places were not removed, and the high places were not removed. Did you know I read the Bible for years before I ever s took the time to figure out what a high place was? I thought it was kind of like Mount Everest, you know? They were building something up on mountains. A high place was a little elevated, two-step up little shrine. And you can't see it, but there's this little god right here, looks like that, who is a representation of the fertility and rain and crop god. And so you would live in the city on your way out to work your fields, <coughs> excuse me, if you wanted your sheep to you know, uh, have little ewes, and if you wanted your cattle to calve, you would, you know, tip your hat, throw a tip, put a little fruit on that thing for good luck. Because this was the God that made animals have young and made your crops grow. And these little shrines were set up everywhere in Israel because the people wanted the best of both worlds. They had this invisible God that was so rough on them with all his rules, and then they had the local gods that all the natives and the inhabitants of the land said, this God will make your crops grow. And so the people wanted to hedge both sides. And this, this is an example of how every Israelite city during the, the kingdom time had these little shrines. And once in a while you hear about people like Josiah, Hezekiah, breaking all these things down. In fact, what you also can't see is both of them are broken. Both of them were, were purposely, intentionally broken, probably during Josiah and Hezekiah's reigns. But that's just a fascinating little uh, sight. But let's go to Acts 9-11. And real quickly, we have 
um, about 15 minutes, I want to start showing you some of the interpretational helps that uh, biblical archaeology gives us. Acts chapter 9, verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Arise, Acts 9, 11, and go to the street called Straight. Oh, so he just typed into his smartphone, Straight, you know? That's the name of a street, right? Like Elm, Pine, you know, uh, Washington Avenue, go to Straight Street. Well, and, and you know what? There's really no doctrinal implications of knowing what straight means. But there are a lot of practical applications of knowing what it means. The street called straight, what would that mean, if anything? Without digging down to that time, we don't really know. But what you find when you dig is it was the main street of the Roman world. They were all the straight street. Every city had one of these streets, they were the main north and south axis of the street. In fact, every Alexander started this. Alexander started laying out cities with a Ducomenus, um, a street that went this way, east and west, and a Cardo that went north and south. So the, the big straight street was called the Cardo, and it, it was on a north-south crossing an east-west, and usually where they met was the agora, the marketplace of the city. And so when they were going to this, they would, the word straight is actually the word cardo. It's the Greek word for heart. You ever heard of we're going into the heart of the city? That is, that is Alexander's when he Hellenized, when he made civilization spread out from Greece all the way to India, he started telling the cities they need to have this structure. And so by the time following Alexander's time, the Roman Empire, so going to the straight street means Paul went to the main street, the, the, the largest, most, you know, the boulevard of Damascus. Now, let, let's go to... Uh, Matthew 8.28, because I want to show you how this affects um, our understanding. I think a lot of times when we think of Jesus, we think of kind of the Jesus video, um, that most of his ministry was about around those people. They're almost barefooted. They're kind of bumpkins. They're kind of like West Virginia, you know, hillbilly, you know, Jed Clampett kind of things. But, but look at Matthew 8 and verse 28, and it says, And when he'd come to the other side, the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed mans. Gergesene was a region that was dominated by a main city, Geresa, or Jeresh, okay? There's Jeresh today. Now, this is how much dirt. You can see this hill. All of this stuff you see was in those layers, you know, of all the civilization. But the archaeologists have dug up this place where you're looking at this, this city that dominated this region in Matthew 8, 28. And look at the forest of columns. Now, that maybe doesn't mean much to you, but now you look at it from a different angle. This is where the two streets met. This is where uh, the Ducomanus crosses the Cardo. Look what's in the center. This is the marketplace of the city. This is the Agora. You might know it by the Roman name. They called it the Forum. Okay, the Forum equaled the marketplace, equaled the Greek word, which you might see sometimes, the Agora. So these three interchangeable terms were for the heart of the city that, that would be very much the place you'd want to go if you wanted to get a message out. And so right here, this, this little strip right there is what we were looking at from the other slide. Um, now we'll look at it from another angle. Look, this is that forest of... Now you can see all these modern Arab homes that this is in the city of Jordan, which used to be the tribe of Manasseh um, in the biblical times. But this city was... This is what the cities look like in the time of Christ. That's not in those Jesus movies. We're talking about millions of people, hundreds of thousands. That's how you could get one group he fed 
when he had 5,000, it was 5,000 men who probably had their wife with them, probably had their two or three kids. We're talking about 20,000 people at a pop. You have to have quite a metropolitan, you know, quite a, a, a wide group of population to get 20,000 people off work to come to an event during the day. You know what I mean? So we're talking about large cities, and this is the Cardo, this main road, and then it would keep going this way. Um, now we're in this marketplace, and, and this, is, this is just very very similar layout to all these cities. But you say, oh, well, that's in Jordan. Um, and, and how do we know Jesus ever went there? Well, we don't. It, he didn't. He got back on the boat. He didn't go there. And most of them had um, these triumphal arches at the end. Uh, I mean, incredible architecture. Most of them, this is right off, I mean, if you went back here to uh, this... Uh, this big uh, plaza, if, if you walk up these steps that you're looking down, we're actually on top of the hill looking down, this is what you're looking at. This is the stairway. All those are stairs. And this is just the, the base of a massive temple that went way up about 100 feet higher that was to the love goddess, Artemis, the goddess that they worshipped with all of their different worship. Uh, this, this is unbelievable, the structural size of these things that was right on, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a person standing right there. I mean, look at the, they're not even up to the bottom of this column, which is about 60 to 80 feet tall. Those columns are only on the deck before you get up to the real thing. I mean, they had some pretty amazing buildings back then. Now, right off of this, this where we're standing is this plaza. This is the bathhouses. In this ancient world, there were a lot of public baths with running water. And, and you would take your bath, the, the toilets were there. It's just civilization. Amazing. Now it's all fallen down, but it's amazing. Okay, now, turn to Matthew 4.25, because, you know, this has all been a nice travelogue, but it has nothing to do with the Bible, because Jesus was never there. Okay, now look at Matthew 4.25, and it says, Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis. Now, all of a sudden, one of the Decapolis cities, that city you just saw, Jerash is the name of it, that's in Jordan. This Decapolis city is in Israel. What I'm going to show you right now, Jesus would have seen. Now see, this ruins the Jesus video. Because when you see the civilization, uh, here, here's the city down here of the time of Christ. This is where King Saul's body was nailed to the wall of, this is the Old Testament city. This is the New Testament city, okay? Unbelievable. Now, if I can get my uh, writing to go away, I want to just show you some of the stuff that's here. Um, this is the Cardo. This is the Forum area, or the Agora. This is the Ducumanus, going this way. All of this are the bathhouses. This is a gigantic, you can't see it, but a theater that seats several thousand people. And they haven't even, this, this city, uh, and you can see there's the columns of the Ducumanus, the east-west one going this way. This city um, is called the Disney World of the Holy Land. It's, it's always a stop whenever you go over to Israel, Bet Shan. But this city shows us how civilized the Holy Land was in the first century. Another view, uh, here's the theater I told you about right there. Here's the Cardo. There are the baths over here. Here's the forum. Do you remember when we were studying redemption? The word for redemption is the word ex agura. So this is the agura. This is the marketplace where slaves were sold. And redemption is to be bought out of the agura. 
And so when Jesus talked about redemption, they all knew about slaves. Every town had, every town in that agora sold slaves. Every town. Slavery was, there were more slaves than citizens in the Roman Empire. And, and so when Jesus talked about redemption, he was talking about something that everyone, I mean, the, the picture just was vivid in their mind. Um, now this is, this is called Palladius Street right here. This is still in, in this Decapolis town of Betchian. Do you see this? This is a raised, kind of like a little raise in the, in the road. That's the sewer system. I mean, they had storm sewers. They had hot and cold running water. This is just the, the colonnade, so you'd have shade. Uh, this is another angle, the big bathhouses over there, the big theater here. There's that storm drain going right down the middle. You say, well, where's the rest of it? Well, they don't want to knock everybody's house down. It's there. It's just huge. Uh, this city is huge. It fell down, by the way, in the great earthquake of uh, um, the 8th century AD. You know what this is? This is an amphitheater. Now, most people would call this, um, you know, it, it, it wouldn't understand the difference between an amphitheater and a theater. A theater only is a half of a circle. An amphitheater is around. It's, it's both sides. Just half of it is a theater. This is an amphitheater. It's round. People sat all the way around. This is an arena where they martyred Christians. At least a thousand we know of from church history died in those sands in Betshean in the first century in the early church. Um, and it was a big city. But uh, Medaba is a town in Jordan where on the floor of a church they found this mosaic. In 500 AD, during the Byzantine time, the Roman Empire in the east side, and, and all of a sudden, people, archaeologists looked at this, in the, they found it, you know, in, in the, like, 1800s AD, and they went, they could read, this is Hag Jerusalem, that's the city of Jerusalem, and they said, Jerusalem has a cardo? This is the cardo, the main north and south drag. Nobody knew Jerusalem had a cardo in 1800. And so somebody looked at this and they said, wow. And so they started digging down in Jerusalem. And, and here are more pictures. That is the Medaba map. It's just, I mean, it wasn't just of Jerusalem. They have found all of these, these sites from the, the early church on this mosaic. This was like a AAA office, you know. Uh, the maps were a little heavier. They weren't made of paper. They were made of tile. I mean, it's unbelievable, everything there. But this is what Jerusalem looked like in the, now they found out, in the, in the um, Byzantine times, the, the post-early um, church era. There's the north-south drag. There's the east-west drag. And all these churches now that, that was on this map, they have found. But let's go to Matthew 8.20, because none of that I said has anything to do with the Bible. It's just interesting. But look at Matthew 8, 20. And Jesus said to him, remember verse 19, the scribe says, hey, I'll go with you everywhere you go. In verse 20, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know what Jesus said? He says, I don't have a home. I don't even own a home. And those people that were hassling Jesus all the way through his ministry, as they started excavating Jerusalem, they found all of these first century roads that are underneath, some of them 20 feet or more, 40 feet, under the surface of modern-day Jerusalem, they have found the first century roads King Herod built. In fact, in July, they just opened uh, a section. Uh, there's a road that goes from uh, the city of David, the Pool of Siloam, underneath all of the Muslim homes and it comes up at the Western Wailing Wall. And you can walk underground on a road that Herod built underneath all of this modern excavation or, or city, and you're 40, 50, 60 feet underground, which is how much the debris has piled up over the years. And it comes out right here at what's called the Wailing Wall, and it's just a continuation of a road that goes all the way up to the Damascus Gate. But this is a little piece of it. This is the column structure. Um, 
it had covering. They've put it together to show you. By the way, above us are all the Jewish houses. This is underneath the Jewish quarter because the Muslims won't let them dig underneath their parts or they'll riot if they do. And so the Jews are allowing all of the under their homes to be dug out and they're finding all the first century level. In fact, you can even shop. This, this is called the Cardo. This is the Cardo. This is the actual first century road and it's all full of Jewish shops. You can eat down there and everything and the whole city's above you. And it's like you're down in the time of Christ and it's a fascinating thing to be there. But what I'm bringing you to is this. This is a house they found under there. This house has 6,000 square feet. This has an indoor swimming pool. How many of you have one of those? I bet not very many. An indoor swimming pool, a 6,000 square foot house with, they even found the, the table and, the, and all of the different uh, uh, plates and serving things and everything. These things are imported from all over the world. China, not the city of China, but they had China that was brought in from far reaches of the Roman Empire. You say, what's so big about that? Look back at, at chapter 8, verse 20. Jesus was alluding to the fact that he lived a very simple, poor life. They were going home to their indoor pools. This is inside the old city of Jerusalem. This house, people were living in there that heard Jesus teach in the temple. And when the destruction of the Romans came, the, the Romans started the city on fire and everything fell. In fact, the house next door, it's grisly, but the people are still, their bones are still there, and they're trying to get their jewels and treasures, and the house burned and fell on them. And you can even find the women had, one woman had her makeup in her hand. Her, her I don't know, lipstick or something. It's, it's, it's still inside the container, and she's holding it. Can you imagine if the house was burning, would you run in and get your makeup? Probably really needed it for some reason. Um, real quickly... Uh, one last thing, and we're going to go with this. We have a minute. If you go to Acts 16, Paul is beaten in Philippi with rods. In chapter 16, verse 40, the next day, after being beaten till you could see the bones, in Acts 16, 40, he starts walking. Acts 17, 1, Paul walks 97 miles. That's how far it is from Philippi to Thessalonica. When he writes back in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, Paul defends his reliability. He says, I'm not unclean, I'm not dishonest, I'm not a crook. Why would he say that? Well, I want you to see something. Every town had a bathhouse, like this over here. If Paul walked into Thessalonica, he would have gone to a public bath. And when Paul went to that public bath, he would have taken his cloak off and he would have hung it up on a hook and he would have taken his tunic off and everyone, as he hung up his tunic, there would have been a collective gasp. His back looked like the lines on a steak, you know, after being on the grill. You know how it sears in those marks? That's what Paul looked like after being beaten in Philippi. And every time he took a bath, which is what normal people that weren't kings had to go to a bathhouse. This is where you use the toilet and you took a bath. And if you're a good Jew, you did both quite frequently. And every time he went in there and hooked his clothes, there were only two people that got beaten like he was, runaway slaves and convicts. And so Paul entered his ministry walking down streets like this, going into bathhouses like that, and, Dave, er, and Paul would experience people not understanding why he'd been beaten. And I could go through lots of other stuff they found, but we don't have time at 716. So, biblical archaeology is the merging of the geography of the Bible with the history of the Bible. Using the Bible as the guide, as the eyewitness account, it makes all of the pieces line up, and all of a sudden, it makes the picture of the New Testament and Old Testament world come alive. Let's all stand for a word of prayer, and then I hope as you're reading the Bible in the days ahead, that you'll pay attention to those little geographic and historical notes because they're eyewitness accounts of real history, real geography, and the archaeologists are verifying it everywhere they go. Father in heaven, I thank you for giving us a book that is so valuable. 
I pray that it would draw our attention more than so much that is really useless, that we can spend an hour without even knowing it, watching something, the latest little video of someone, when we aren't listening to the voice of the very God of the universe. And I pray that we would want your word to feed our souls because it's reliable. Plus, it's so fascinating the more we study it. And I pray that you'd strengthen us to that end, that we may be holding forth the word of life, that we may rejoice in the day of Christ, that we have not run or labored in vain because we've walked in step with your word. And we ask that in the precious name of Jesus and for your glory alone and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.